Hello everyone and welcome to Stuff I Find Interesting, the second part of four because I had way too much content uh, and also I talked for way too long. So this time we're not going to talk as long or we're at least we're going to try not to and I'm going to wrap up part four and that's so that I can continue to practice this and, um, and get better and I mean these days you need any skill you can get, right? I mean anything really so anyway going back to last time oh and also I'm still using the word interesting too much so I gotta watch that and I need to talk a little bit slower okay in my last episode I talked about the Magao grottos or the thousand Buddha caves and this is what they look like so these are some of the caves. Uh, there's 492 of them. This is in the Xinjiang province area, which is what we were talking about the last time with uh, Turfin. Um, so just one of the oldest continuously occupied Buddhist sites in the entire world. It's been in active use for a thousand years. And I think the fact that it's kind of on the outlying edges of the empire is what is what has kept it safe and now it's it's a tourist attraction and and that's going to keep it safe which is i don't know i guess it's a trade-off um but it's something that you can make money on so that's what it's become now so it's i mean i would probably spend money to go look look at that that's very cool um and i think it extends into other mountains i don't think that's the only mountain like i said there's the ones that you know that the tourists go into and then <clears throat> there's the other ones okay so we were talking last time about Jacob Jacob de Gain and his flowers and I was saying how he went from a mannerist type of painter or etcher to someone who painted stuff like this so this is um, typical of, of Dutch um, still lifes of flowers from this period <clears throat> and we can even see here we've got a um, Remember, I made reference to the insects and stuff. He doesn't have a lot of insects, but he's got a little lizard here, and that's fairly common. That's what you would see in these in these Dutch paintings. Uh, they're beautiful. They're some of my favorite paintings, and something I would probably hang on my wall. But one of the more eccentric ones with like more like little kind of hidden things in it. This one's pretty um, pretty straightforward, and you can see it's sort of mounted in a shadow box. So, thought that was cool. And this is some of the other stuff he did. So he went to a more naturalist. <clears throat> style and he incorporated it into his art and it was accepted and people said yay all right so we are briskly moving along ah no 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 come back baby come back any kind of fool could see all right here we go ukrainian map collection arrives at harford so this is f actually from 2006 and from what I understand and what I was able to find out, this is in a private collection now. Some of it has been digitized, not a lot of it. Um, the reason why this is so important and why the preservation of maps of a particular area is so important is because they represent the culture of the time in <clears throat> as far as like what things are called and the types of pictures that appear in the margins. And I'll show you what I mean. And it's kind of a snapshot of, of society at that time. So <clears throat> this is, you're going to love this. So this is the empire. Um, and you can see it's divided into some areas over here. Now we sit here and, and, and it, it took me a while to figure out where I was and what I was looking at it because this is like really kind of heavy stuff. So this is a Russian map, not a Ukrainian one or a Moscovian, um, as they sometimes call themselves. Um, but if we look on this map, we can see, if I can hold it still, in here, I'm pretty sure I found it. Let's see if I can find it again. Uh, can I find it? Can I find it? Can I find it? Mm, I found it. I was so proud of myself. I was like, oh, look at that. I found it. All right. Where are you? I found Turpin on here the place we were talking about last time um, it's in here it's it's in 
it's in like this area like this whole area it's in there somewhere and it just goes to show the 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 how close and tight the borders are in um that particular part of the world and uh, what you know during the silk War times this was uh, 1600 there was still definitely some some silk war um s silk road i'm sorry i said silk road silk war travel going on as i trip over my words so these are some of the scan maps i'll include the link in the thing so you can check it out most of these maps are pretty basic um there's some uh tartaria stuff in there which is a conspiracy we're not going to get into today but it's a whole thing and it's it's fascinating and it's like why why that why like why do people attach themselves to certain conspiracies rather than other ones and it's it's kind of a snapshot i think of of the time period and with tartaria it's we've been lied to and that's the whole kind of theme by the man by the people in charge the powers that be and the irony is is we have been lied to we're lied to right now continuously lied to but perhaps not about that so now there are 7,000 underground gas bubbles that are posed poised to explode in the Arctic this is from 2017 I believe the number is higher um, once again I couldn't find a whole lot I need to start finding new ways to find stuff because Google has significantly changed their algorithm it's not as easy to find things anymore I'm sure that's kind of on purpose anyway in Siberia there's permafrost which is ground that remains completely frozen like all year round it never completely thaws Th the top will thaw but then there's this layer of, of frozenness um, that is there and ice snow it, it captures chemicals in the in the atmosphere and sort of densifies them so there's this permafrost with all this stuff kind of locked into it that's been you know building up and building up and building up because the permafrost continues to kind of grow and um, you know at least on top depending on you know what the weather's like and structures are built to accommodate the permafrost issue because um, if we look at the population uh, impacted by loss of permafrost it accounts for 24 percent of the terrestrial part of the northern hemisphere and 1.3 million people live in settlements where permafrost will degrade and ultimately disappear uh, by 2060 so that means the structures that were built are, are no longer viable they become vulnerable to shifting to um, coming apart <clears throat> and out of the 907 permafrost settlements in 2017 only 473 will remain this change will mainly affect settlements in the Russian north and in Alaska so inland not as much outland if we look at the circle like the Bering Strait Russia that whole area it's you know it's it's something that's coming for sure and I thought that that was an, an interesting thing but getting back to the gas bubbles what's happening is the permafrost is thawing and it's creating these bulgy bulgy things and these aren't the pictures I wanted to show you these are scientists pictures where they're flying overhead and, and they're taking pictures of the the pockets that are look like they're going to go um, so the end result is you get something like this it's also called a pingo so the gas accumulates it builds up the permafrost is holding it in place the permafrost thaws releases all that stuff and also the weight the methane gas comes flying out um, here's an overhead view of this same one so this is bedrock and then this would be the um, permafrost mud stuff that would be on top here's another one and we have another one in winter there's a guy going down one there's a big one another another often they fill up with water and they're happening in areas well they were originally happening in areas where people didn't know that they happened because they were just so far out but what's happening now is is happening closer and closer to where people are are, are living and um, the temperature has gotten as high as 35 degrees Celsius I need to look that up what is 35 degrees Celsius
95 degrees. So 95 freaking degrees in Siberia. You know, but I guess climate change isn't happening. And, you know, it doesn't matter why climate change is happening. Who cares if it's man-made at this point? We need to fix it. We need to do stuff about it. Um, stuff's happening. Uh, it's very clear. It's not, like, vague at this point. Um, but corporations continue to obfuscate all of this kind of stuff uh, in the interest of profit. But it's a Tuesday after a long weekend. I don't want to upset myself. Doctor says I need to work on my blood pressure. We're going to move on. So talking about the environment, the promise of batteries that come from trees. This is called lignin, and it's the stuff that makes wood woody. So what makes wood woody? Lignin. <laughs> so it's been discovered that, um, so there's this forest in Finland, and they have all these trees, and stuff's digital now. We're not using as much paper, thank God. Um, although digital has its own whatever. But 30% of a tree, most trees, are, are lignin, which is a lot and it's the glue that holds everything together and it holds carbon and carbon makes a great material for a vital component in batteries and the great thing is is that paper or plants or raw trees can be used so it's like the stuff that nobody wants can be used and turned into this sort of um, <clears throat> kind of uh, almost graphite kind of thing that that now can operate a, a battery and so we look here um, why should I care? It's the most abundant natural po aromatic polymer on the earth, synthesized by all land plants. In fact, if you were to cut down a tree and allow all the wood to dry out, the lignin would be responsible for 20 to 25 percent of the dry weight. Very few people have heard of it. I know I've never heard of it. It provides structural support, aids in water transportation, and protects against pathogen attack. The image to the left illustrates the fact that lignin is found in land plants and that lignin is more specifically localized to the plant cell wall and then it goes into sort of the chemical the chemical structure so they're looking at ways of, of taking this um, leftover stuff and the trees that that need to be cut down because they're actually they're they're not native species they were built for the purpose of just growing trees for paper and they're not really um, they're not as useful anymore so I thought that that was very cool. So we're going to go into the next set of bookmarks, and I am cruising along. I am feeling so proud of myself right now. Um, I probably shouldn't get too cocky, though, right? Okay. <coughs> photography. This uh, session's photographer is Martin Stupik. And I, I just like Stupik. What's your name? Mr. Stupik. You know, I mean, obviously it sounds like stupid, but, you know, it's just, it's kind of funny. Anyway, this guy talks about how uh, the conquistadors and, you know, the, the of, of, of the modern age are the Rockefellers. And, you know, all of this industry that got built is like mm -hmm. the modern sort of, um, like when the Spanish came in and, you know, they, they, you know, took over everything like in Florida and Mexico. It's kind of similar. The colonizers have come in and are building these particular structures but I like what he has to say so I'm gonna just read if you will indulge me read what he wrote 400 years before I began photographing Paso del Norte's historic smelting landscape conquistadors traversing it on horseback and waded north across the Rio Grande where it cuts a gash through the Rocky Mountains the lore was silver gold and pagan souls all promising generous returns for the trouble by the mid 19th century El Camino Real joining Mexico City to Santa Fe through today's El Paso was well worn. Its, rut, its rutted, parched landscape was infamous, first trod by indigenous hunters and traders, and then by Spanish soldiers, Catholic missionaries, also the Jesuits, migrants, then mining engineers, railroad surveyors, and captains of industry, hoping to claim the treasure that the conquistadors had missed. Um, I have some future stuff about Mexico that goes further into this and also goes into the El Camino um, Real this this famous road that kind of joins up things so we have a uh, picture here that I think is kind of cool looking up a uh, stack interior the view up between the, the uh, twin flues by the 1800s eastern speculators had reshaped, reshaped the continent's mountain spine from Alaska to southern Mexico much of it along the historic Camino route wilderness morphed into industrial landscape a network of mines and smelters linked by a grid of new railroads to deep water ports and world markets 
controlling most of it by either influence or outright ownership, were a half dozen of Gilded Age icons, Clark, Hearst, Heinz, Huntington, Rockefeller, Meyer, Guggenheim, uh, and so on. That rowdy era was as much clad in copper as gilt in gold. Copper, its mining, smelting, refining, was at the heart of an enormous new fortunes, primary among them Guggenheim's. The family name, after more than a century, remains a synonym for philanthropy, arts patronage, and implausible wealth. Learning that Guggenheim money had come quite literally from dirt and rock was news to me. So this guy was like, oh, wow, I didn't know that that's where they got their money from. I wanted to know these these trabajos, the smelter laborers and their compatriots, those who had worked the mines under Santa Eulalia in Mexico and deep beneath Leadville in Colorado. Artifacts in the departed don't easily give up their stories. The best I can do is photograph remnants of their ephemeral landscape. El Paso smelter site and worker cemetery, California Gulch in the Colorado Rockies, Santo Domingo in the desert canyon above, and Huidad Chihuahua. The story, the vista, spans 1,500 miles, but nowhere to be seen, not even as mirages over the horizon, are Peggy Guggenheim's Venetian Palace, or El Museo Guggenheim, or the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum in Man Manhattan. So he's, he's kind of making the reference that, you know, in the East you have these, you know, the Guggenheim Museum and stuff. And when you say Guggenheim, that's what people think of, but actually this is where the money came from. And so that's sort of what, you know, what he's, what he's getting at. And so we have some pictures of the, um, of a railroad cut. So this is kind of the area. And this ex ex originally was just, you know, horses and monks. And, and now it's this whole sort of corridor of, of industry, um, much sort of like Ohio is across the top of the United States. This is sort of, you know, kind of down like this. So we have some more pictures. Um, this is an incline belt conveyor with color-coded gas delivery bus. Um, fragments of a cylindrical furnace. Look at that big thing, big old bucket. Uh, Lots of abandoned stuff out, out that way, too. This is a smelter copper converter building with furnace. And I'm just scrolling through these. And I just imagine climbing up these stairs. And see, they have this here so that you can, like, hang out and go, like, nope, 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 nope. nope. Okay, okay. Then you go back up. <laughs> you stop there. Nope, 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 nope. It would take a lot of money for me to do that. All right, so here we have some uh, the demolition of two some stacks, uh, north end of smelter site. This is New Mexico, Magdalena, New Mexico, and that's pretty much <clears throat> what I wanted to show you. Is just show you that this is a part of the United States that very few people see. These are coke ovens. This is where. Um, the uh, charcoal co where the coal was processed um, before it was moved more coke ovens um, <clears throat> so the coke ovens were used to uh, stoke the furnaces that were used to do however the smelter process works I didn't I didn't look that part up this is kind of cool I wouldn't mind running through there it looks like a little kind of this is the Santa Brigida silver mine site mineral de pozos in mexico some of the mines in mexico are they're beautiful they're like works of art um i mean it's very destructive it ruins the water supply tears up the land mining is a very very um earth intensive uh thing okay we're going to come back to this because this is this is like just insane um i found this really cool map this is fairyland and someone actually sat down and made this map. So if we scroll in, we have the Bay of Moaning. This island is enchanted, the Bay of Dreams. We have someone clinging to a, a, a pillar. We've got some mermaid people. Here they do magic. Black Adder Lake, the weird wor wood, the weird wood. If we scroll over, it starts to get a little bit more sunnier. And we've got this 
great little tower with the fairies swimming in it, the river of white nymphs, here are quicksands, um, little Bo Peep, so there's some like nursery rhyme stuff in here. Um, this was made in, let's see when this was made, the link will be in here, but this was made in 1920 with a question mark, not really sure, but it looks like it's from that, from that era, and you can tell that that's what it is because of the way that it is. No, I'm joking. <laughs> it's because of the design, the way it's made, the font. It's just very kind of 1920s-ish. Okay. We'll go back to that other map. But first, we're going to talk about the living and growing stones of Romania. So there are these stones in Romania that grow and move according to the locals. But as far as I can see, they don't, they don't move. But they do grow. Here's the stone. Some more stones. So they're called Travants, and they're considered to be alive. And here's some more. And then depending on exactly where you are in Romania, they look a little different. See, these are a little darker. These are a little lighter. Um, I've seen pictures of people um, hanging out on these things. I don't think you can do that anymore. If you were to cut one of these open, you would see rings. And so is it, is it, what is it, what's happening? So first of all, it's a hoodoo, a, a type of hoodoo, which is a tent rock, fairy chimney, or earth pyramid, which is a, uh, a spire of rock formed by erosion. So these concretions were formed by erosion. Specifically, it is thought that an earthquake shook everything and the sand sort of clung together and sort of created this, this sort of unique um, kind of rock. So like quicksand, if you slap it, it hardens up and it's, it's very hard. But if you gently put your hand into it, almost like that slime stuff, it goes right in. So it's sort of, it, that's what happened. Um, the earth, there was an earthquake, everything went, the, everything liquefied except for these concretions, which kind of hung together. So here we have some more um, pictures, but what's actually happening is that there's a type of mineral or minerals in there that precipitate out when the rocks get wet and it forms like a shell and it does that over and over and over again. Romania has uh, weather not too dissimilar from New York so it rains you know probably like 30 40 percent of the time and so they grow. Here's one that's cut open and you can see it's it's got the rings and there are concretions um, that can be found in, in England that are that are famous, that people will go looking for. Um, I don't have a whole lot of information on those, but it kind of reminds me of the Gobi agates. So Gobi agates, you say, oh, what are those? Well, this is something that I want for um, next Christmas. So if anybody's taking notes, these are from Mongolia, from the Gobi Desert. And look at how wild these things are. They're just these crazy looking rocks and if we go to shopping let's say I'll, let's say I, f I was feeling wealthy and I want to blow my rent money on some rocks and then I sort it by high to low a single rock can go for as much as eight hundred dollars doesn't necessarily me mean that people are paying that um, and you can see when they're illuminated they have a different kind of look most likely they probably go for like a hundred bucks but a hundred bucks for a rock a hundred bucks for a rock so then you might say well what's going on what's this about it's kind of similar to the Travance in that let me translate this hang on I cannot read simplified Chinese I'm good but I'm not that good English okay so this person um, purchased an, an, a stone and it would seem that they're a scientist from what I can understand reading all of this and they were like, well, what, what is this thing? I'm going to study it. And it turns out that these agates are part stone, part like a biological, like almost like a biofilm. So they're sort of like stromatolites, which are some of the oldest organisms on the entire planet, but they travel. So what happens is there's this little piece of sediment and for whatever reason, another piece sticks to it, and then another piece, and it rolls around the desert, and it rolls around the desert, and keeps picking stuff up and picking stuff up. Um, 
And then what can happen to some of those is they can get shoved underground into like, you know, just from the movement of the earth or dune shifting or whatever. So there's different kinds and the ones that are deep in the earth are the ones that are, um, I guess, worth more money. I kind of like the ones that are more on the surface that are kind of small and, and colorful. So these are from two billion years ago and they are microbial fossils. And it says, in order to confirm the strange stone I bought was two billion years ago silicon bacteria fossil as described in the text, I sliced it. And then they sliced it, they looked at it under a microscope and they were able to see that there are um, things in there similar to microorganisms that you would see in uh, stromatolite. Here's one that's cut, up, cut open. Here we have some microphone or microphone. Oh my God. Microscope. Jeez. That was tough. <laughs> microscope, microscope, microscope. Okay. So anyway, I thought that was really cool. Now, before we talk about the ballet Russe is, we are going to talk about this crazy, crazy map that I came across. I mean, this map is like, I don't know that I've ever seen anything like it. So this is an extraordinary but mysterious shaker image. So there was this guy, Jacob Skeen, and he made this, ba this map in 1887, and it was designed as an educational tool to help arrest the decline of the shaker community. So he felt that people were not as religious and the, the values were falling apart, and so he put his heart and soul into creating this map, which was uh, two feet by four feet. And not only did he create the map, but there's a 64-page key of explanation to Skeen's genealogical charts. And that is held by the same museum that has this, the original, original map. So it's like a map and a family tree and some other stuff on it. But I'm going to show you because that will, you'll see. Okay, so here's the map. Obviously, you can't see anything. But if we go like this, we can see we've got, let's go up to the top here. We've got the devil's powers, names and references to character, power, and influence upon mankind of the devil as recorded in the books of the Old and New Testaments. So um, I'm being dramatic. But yeah, so there's, there's the, uh, the Bible passages. If you wanted to see how the devil's character is described, you could go there and you could look at it. So it could be used as an educational tool if someone was preaching and they wanted to talk about the devil and how the shaker community was like going to the devil or something they could look at their little chart and they could say oh uh, we have Peter verses 5 to 8 let's 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 look at that now we can go over here it's a geographical chart embracing biblical and profane history of ancient times from Adam to Christ so we have a map of the whole world then we have a thing about Adam and Eve with Methuselah. Okay. So these are key figures. We have Noah, Adam, and Eve, and Terah. So these are their individual family trees. And then if we go up here, we've got Jesus, I believe, up here. Christ, yes. And then we've got brothers and sisters of David. Um, if we go down here, we've got a timeline of Carthage timeline of Persia, timeline of Assyria, uh, Egypt, stuff that was going on, going on, who was in charge at different times. Um, but just an absolutely fascinating, I just, I can't imagine this, the, the, the level of detail, this guy had a really great brain and ability to organize because he put a lot of information into a very sort of compact, compact thing. Okay, now we're going to talk about Ballet Russe. So Ballet Russe was, even though it was like Ballet Russian, it was actually uh, itinerant, which meant that it traveled around and it actually never went to Russia, but it, they called it Ballet Russe because Russia was seen as sort of, um, um, you know, exotic, sort of like that whole Orient Orientalism thing that I talked about in the first f episode, if anybody watched that horrible piece of work. Um, but the Ballet Russe, it was... Um, there were all the young comp composers, um, Stravinsky, Debussy, um, Ravel, 
there were artists, Kandinsky, Picasso, Matisse, they were all involved in this ballet route. So it was sort of this multicultural thing that really actually had an influence on fashion. It had an influence on music. It had an influence on art. Um, probably had an influence on the traje trajectory of people's, you know, sort of, sort of thinking. And just an absolute, this is the guy that started it. You can see he's a, he's a dapper looking fellow. Check him out. Yeah, we've got, um, this is um, by August Mackey. Um, so we've got some ballet russe stuff. This is incredible. These watercolors of the backdrops of the various um, scenery, backdrops for the ballets, just incredible incredible out of this world this is a costume this is a, a site design um, background more costume more costume more costume just amazing like you could collect just stuff dealing with ballet ruse and you know have yourself a nice little collection of stuff because there's a lot to be associated with it <clears throat> so he um, it revolutionized ballet so there was things that they did dance wise that hadn't been done before um, dance was more fluid and expressive as opposed to going through movements it was actually you know there was movement and the movement was to the music it was just a whole it was a whole it was a whole different thing here we have some pictures check out this costume how cool is that huh that's very cool right um, We've got some more cause with these are uh, swimming costumes designed by Coco Chanel. More costumes, sort of like a bow house, uh, Bauhaus kind of vibe, I think. And then these are some of the some of the outfits, which are kind of like my favorite part. <clears throat> so here we have. I'm not sure what to call those, but they're fabulous. Look at the fabric, the detailing on the skirt. Uh, this with the uh, embroidered. Um, flowers the colors are just just so rich and eye-popping this is a very 1920s influenced kind of dress a flapper kind of dress and I you know you could see this on someone right now today someone could put this on and you'd be like oh yeah timeless absolutely timeless these are just so much fun I, I want all of them in my closet right now I don't know where I'd wear them but I'd wear them this is from uh, for the prince in Loiseau d'Or, which is the gold bird, I believe, if my five years of French serves me correctly. Thank you, Mrs. Roberts. So, yeah, so those are the costumes. I just thought that was really neat. I came across that on, uh, on Messy Nessie Chic, which I'm going to just show you right now. So this is Messy Nessie Chic. This is one of my favorite, favorite websites and the person that runs this, um, that this is her website, she's been doing this for like 10 years and she just has just such a wealth of information. So this is an architect that I like, that I think you will like too. His name is Gowdy and his stuff is definitely Gowdy. I don't wonder if that's where that word comes from. I don't know, but look at that, wild. You could live up there, you could go up those stairs. I, that's where I want my bedroom, right there. That is a observation tower. Um, so I guess you can go up there, but not, not to live. So he was uh, born in 1928 to a Catholic father and a Jewish mother. He came from a complex background as a half Jew, growing up in a Nazi era Central Europe. He was baptized into the Catholic Church in 1935 took his father's religion and to save himself and his Jewish mother, he joined the Hitler Youth to keep up Aryan appearances. However, his practicing Catholicism and membership in the Hitler Youth didn't save any of his Jewish relatives who were killed in concentration camps. So here, here he is. He's a wild looking guy, right? Check him out. That's Gowdy. That's probably what you would expect. He's like perched like a bird. Um, here he is again perched. I guess he, he likes that position. Here he is older looking like something out of a Wes Anderson film right there. Um, I'm almost certain this inspired Wes Anderson directly, this exact photo. I mean, look at it. The clogs, the candle, the gas lamp, the book, the color of the hat, the color of the blanket. 
Here he's got some, uh, he's doing some more drawing. This is a, what is this? This is a hotel. So if you uh, would like, you could stay there. I don't know what the inside looks like. Here's another picture. You can see there's a, a grass on the roof. Here's some of the pillars of the hotel. This is in Osaka, Japan. Another observation tower. This is an apartment complex. In Vienna. This is another apartment complex. I would love to live there. That's another picture of the same one we saw before. This is the hotel, same one we saw before, just a different, a different view. This is another uh, residential building. This is in Germany. This is the garbage facilities in Osaka, Japan. So this is their garbage facilities building. Wild. He loved designing things that were normally not designed with any sort of thought. For example, he designed a bathroom, a whole bathroom thing in New Zealand on this island. 10,000 people a year go to see this bathroom. So it's kind of crazy. So I need to check my phone real quick because it's going off. Um, and then we're going to talk about, actually, you know what? We're going to cruise through this. We're going to cruise through this. I'm going to get up, grab my phone, but I'm going to keep talking. I'm going to keep talking so you can hear me. So. It's possible I could get an important message. So we're going to talk about we're going to end with today's conspiracy theory and today's conspiracy theory is um, that the world's fairs were used as an excuse to demolish America's ancient and architectural heritage so according to this theory America had reached great heights of architecture and culture and education and then it was all sort of taken from us and the world's fairs were a way to show off these buildings and then and then get um, I forgot what I was saying because I've got some crazy crazy thing um, okay so interesting right like what's up with that so the above picture is called the Palace of Fine Arts it was constructed in 1915 for the Panama Pacific International Exposition in San Francisco if the official history is to be believed, then why does this period painting from the early 1900s show the structure already heavily weathered as it is covered in moss and vines? If the building was built when they said it was and it should have looked brand new instead it looks ancient. Um, it should be pointed out that um, it was designed to look kind of ancient. So here it is, and this building actually still stands. So here's people down here. So this guy's saying... This is not a temporary structure. This is a permanent structure. If it was temporary, it wouldn't wouldn't look like that. From my understanding, it was added on to, like reinforced. They decided to keep it. They were like, "Oh, this is a cool, this is a cool, a cool building." Um, so this goes into. I'll put the link in, you know, as usual in in the thing, and you can see, you can read the whole thing for yourself. It's fascinating in any event, and it it it's it's just very interesting to think about. Um, here we have some uh, World's Fair buildings. This is what we're going to end up with. Um, we're going to close it down. Hopefully this is less than 45 minutes. Um, and I hope everybody has a, uh, a great week. Um, I'm not sure when I'll do the next episode, but I want to keep them closer together so I don't get jammed up on oh it's no good I don't like it because now I have to start working on post-production with like music and the camera going in and out and effects and stuff now that I've got my setup set up I can focus on other things like bringing you lots of interesting stuff in a way that's not boring